Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Workplace Wanderer. It has been a week since I've seen all your lovely faces and I all your lovely ears, I guess, if you're listening to this on the audio format. That's a weird statement to make. Um, but I am I'm happy to be here. As always, I brought on an interesting guest for us to have a conversation with today. And uh, speaking of having conversations, that is the topic for the day is conversations within the workplace. Today, we have somebody on who I'm very excited to talk to, somebody I got a chance to meet officially last week on Zoom. I think we call that officially meeting nowadays. Yeah, we, uh, yeah. Right, that, it is. Um, but I, I was glad to get a chance to have a conversation with you. I think we got into some cool areas really quickly and I, the conversation flowed really well. And it was pretty apparent as soon as we got off the Zoom, I'm like, I want to have her on the podcast. I want to have a, <laughs> another conversation with her. So everybody, please welcome Kara Kirby. All right. Awesome. Thanks for having me, Blake. We're going to have so much fun today. And yeah. um, I guess I'll go ahead and introduce myself. Well, before you do, I just want to make the okay. statement again, as I usually do, is that I, I always ask guests to introduce themselves, maybe give me a brief bio, the whole purpose of having guests do this themselves instead of sending me a bio in advance, which is usually like a scripted bio that people just kind of uh, reuse, recycle. The whole point of it is to to be more inclusive so people can f change how they feel. They may feel more like a parent one day or feel more like a business person another day. So however you want to introduce yourself today, I want you to feel uh, comfortable in doing so. So Kara, if you don't mind, let's let's give people a little bit of a, your background and who you are today. Okay. I am both equally parent and business person. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Um, and I actually think the two complement each other, which doesn't get talked about enough. I always say that when people go on paternity or maternity leave, it should be regarded as a leadership development program. I have been in the world of organizational development since, I don't know, it's since I was, it's been like 17 years now. And I worked inside of corporate America. I've always been focused on people and helping people develop and be at their best and work better together. I've, I did that in corporate America for 15 years, and then I just went off on my own three years ago. And so I have a leadership development company. So I do a lot of team workshops and leadership workshops. And I just really, I work with groups of people to help them figure out ideas of how, how do they make spaces inside of their work where that ideas can flourish, innovation mm -hmm. can flourish, and that people don't, they, they like going there. Like work does yeah. not have to suck. <laughs> That is there such a are, good point. but I think sometimes people don't know how to make it not suck. And so I give them the education and platform to know how to make it great. So essentially you're a change maker. You're you're going into workplaces and helping them reconfigure the way that they're operating, it sounds like, so that it can be more conducive to people's happiness and contentment and productivity at work. Is that am I yeah, picking up definitely. on that? Okay. It's a great way to put it. I, I do my best. I don't try to, <laughs> Sure. I make changes where I can. I think that's something we learn quickly as consultants that we, we go into these situations and we can do the best that we can. We can present the new ideas. We can offer them an accurate diagnosis. And it's really up to the organization themselves to follow through on the mm -hmm. recommendations and uh, not to, to be too cliche here, but change is hard. Change People, is hard. People don't want to change. And when it comes down to it, it, it change within a living system, like an organization that that's a big undertaking. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, I, it all comes back to the central theory of if people want to make that change, it, it has to be their decision. So mm. I always talk about that. Whatever I'm doing is that if you're trying to force change on a person, it's generally not going to be successful. But if you include people into that change process, you have a much higher likelihood of it being successful, whether yeah. it's your husband, your wife, your child, your organization, a coworker, like it had, like you have to help people figure out and come to their own conclusions and do it in a non-manipulative way. Like that's when the magic happens. I'm connecting the dot to what you said earlier about parenting and leadership development. I think what you just said <laughs> is such a great, a great example of that is if you want your kid to do something, good luck just trying to tell them to do it and, and getting it to happen. It's it's a tough process and you got to get them to be motivated to do what you're asking them to do, right? 
Yeah, absolutely. It's It's a great metaphor for work change. It's I, yeah, it's hard. (laughs) Yeah. Or, you know, I think I have, I have some clients that are, that are in the biotech space mm -hmm. and you have these insanely intelligent people who are so studied and they just can see the, the, these connections that normal people can't see. And, and all, I think that sometimes life can be really frustrating in that situation because you see how everything could work and you see what's happening five miles down the road, but, but you also have to bring people along and you can't just say, this is my vision, go do it. Like that, mm. it's, it's a really, really difficult tension if you're in that space where you can see everything and you know what's best for somebody, but they have to come to the conclusion on their own as well. Right. Okay, so like leadership creating the vision for the people that that need to really enact the change is is not really the best idea, and instead include them in the vision. Oh, yeah, if process? you can, yeah, definitely. Okay. That I makes mean, a lot of a sense. A vision is fine, you know. Like I always like to subscribe to <laughs> any. <laughs> The bar is so low, right? So if like you're creating a vision and it's really compelling and it's working for you, awesome. If you want to take that a step further, it's including people in that vision. So I don't want to negate that. If you have a great vision, that's totally fine. But um, you're doing better than most. (laughs) Sometimes people don't even do that. Mm. Uh, But taking it a step further is getting people together that are closest to the customer, closest to the problem and and developing that vision together. That's, That's whenever you're at the highest peak, in my humble opinion. Okay. No, that makes a ton of sense. And and I'm I have to apologize. I brought up vision. I was sort of having one of those like thoughts in my head that I didn't really uh, give you the full thought, but what you were saying led me to, I guess, I always think the first part of a change process is creating the vision for the change. Mm. Where are we trying to go? So I left that part out of my, my question to you, but that's, (laughs) that's why I brought up vision and the kind of the vision creating processes, like managers and leaders saying, okay, here's the vision for the change. Here's what we want to see the company do. Here's how we're going to get there and not including the people who are going to be affected by the change in that process. I could see them just I mean, I naturally being a little disgruntled or annoyed with it or not understanding uh, Mm -hmm. how it's going to be implemented or what it's going to mean for them in their day-to-day life, but including them in the process, I could see how it would motivate them and also alter what the potential vision could be. Because again, they're the ones who are going to be living the change day-to-day. So they should be the ones to really help direct that that vision where the change is going. Yes. (laughs) It sounds so simple, right? When you say it out loud. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, it does. And even as I was saying it, I'm thinking like, this is such a a simple process, but again, it goes back to that living, the organizations are living systems and like, it's nothing is simple with human beings. Yeah, definitely. And a lot of people are taught top-down leadership. It's what they saw modeled maybe in their family structure Mm -hmm. or their first jobs. And so being, I, I always think that this is really an interesting, everything is like a deeper psychological process. Mm -hmm. So like to be able to move into a more inclusive, collaborative way of working where you're like, I'm a human, you're a human, we're all just humans together. Let's make this vision together. You have to also, in a sense, reject that top down um, authoritative leadership style that someone you really respect has probably told you is the right way to do things. Right. So it's it also can be complicated in that way as well. Yeah. I mean, that that top-down model is it's just so it just exists within our entire society and our system. And it's been mm-hmm. we've been using it for so many decades. And we're finally starting to shift away from it in some places, uh, which again, it does work in, in in some organizations if that's what you want to do. But there's most of the time, like with people's access to information these days the top-down model really has shifted the way that people operate and they want a more inclusive process than what it was before. We're, we're taught now more, I guess, as followers, quote unquote, to question things because we have access to more information. Yeah. So it's, it's things have changed so much. So I want to bring us to the topic of conversation. (laughs) And I, I guess, um, I guess if you're enacting a change, you're, you're wanting to change the conversations that people are having. 
I, and I'm, I'm saying that because I'm thinking of a book, I think it's called Helping by Edgar Schein, mm -hmm. um, which I is a great, man. yeah, I, I know, right? Um, uh, it's a great book. And if you're in any type of helping profession or just a human being in general, it's a great book to read. But I, I believe he talks about the need to change conversations. Like as part of the change process is changing the way that we talk about whatever it is that we're trying to change or the organization itself, I think is something that he touched on. Right. Is, is yeah. that. Um, yes, definitely. Like there's, there's so many different tentacles to it. And I hope that we get into this today because there's really practical things that people can take away from this. And I'll tell you a little bit about my journey of learning about conversations and how to weave some of this stuff into, because I think it's really important because I was not um, before I started educating myself, I was not good at conversations. I was not good at conflict. Like I did not have the skill set, in which I have now found that a lot of people don't as well. Hmm. So yes, to your question about helping there in, and, and I love his book too. Humble Consulting is about it, it, again, it goes back to that. How do you relinquish control and pay and realize that the conversation is the most important thing that you are doing. And whether that conversation was with a group or with, if it's with the other person, it's not even the res maybe a little bit of the result that comes out of it, but it's how you have that conversation is going to build that relationship. It's going to build the innovation. It's going to build the inclusion. And I think that sometimes people think that conversations are just a given. Like they don't really understand the weight that is put into like every single conversation that you have in your life and your work, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of weight there. Yeah. I, I keep thinking of like the, the signs that we, like the posters we had up in middle school, that's like words matter, <laughs> but it's, yeah, it's right? so true. Right. <laughs> I, I mean, the way that it's, there's like a contagion, there's like a contagion that goes on in workplaces where if the conversations go toxic or are very negative, it spreads like wildfire. And the, obviously the adverse is true there as well. And uh, the way that people speak about a certain person, I mean, the conversations we have create the perceptions that we have at work and can really shape the entire workplace. When I, when I brought up asking you to, uh, to decide on a topic, you brought up conversations. What what makes you feel like conversations um, play such a huge role in the workplace? And what were you specifically, let me actually back that up for a second. What were you specifically <laughs> thinking when you brought up conversations? What types of conversations were you referring to? Well, I think that you and I both study leadership and we both study cultures and when, when I asked you that question, I just thought it would be an interesting conversation for us to have, because one of the things I'm always thinking about, like, is what makes a great culture or what makes a really coercive culture? Mm -hmm. What are those elements? And then what do you, how do you peel back the pieces and what's happening behind those pieces? So sometimes you can say, oh, that culture is really damaging to people. Maybe it's the leadership practices. And if we fix those leadership practices and that culture won't be as bad anymore. But if you ask it further, you're like, well, why is that leadership practice so damaging then you start to uncover more different things. And, and if you get down to the core, sometimes there's a lot of things that are at that core, in my opinion, but one of the things that's at that core is the way that people talk to each other. So it's that it's mm -hmm. the conversations that people have. The reason why you have that leader that's such a toxic leader is generally because of the way that they talk to people. It's the way that they engage in conversations. So, and, and so I just like, that's why I brought that up. I was like, this could be like a really interesting topic to get people thinking about conversations. First of all, it's a way to look at organizations and leadership. It's it, it got me thinking about it in a different way. But also if you're just somebody that's working inside of your career or you're building your leadership capabilities, if you can, if you can kind of have this light bulb go off about conversations and the mindset that you have going into them, it can be one of the best tools that you have inside of your practice is understanding mm. difficult conversations is understanding like your own triggers and how you enter in conversations. It's just such a beautiful area of development as well. 
Yeah, this I, I can't help but think that as, as you were talking, I'm always trying to find, okay, so what are the practical steps, the practical changes that we can start to make? And I, my first thought was going to, I guess it's, it's with ourselves. We have to become intentional. Mm -hmm. We have to get to know ourselves and our biases and understand our experiences and get some, I guess, some, uh, maybe a 360 feedback on how we interact with the people around us versus what, how we think we interact with the people around us. But it, I, I imagine if we want to improve the conversations we have and make them more effective, it really starts with us, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, a hundred percent. It starts with you. And, and, and if, if you don't mind, I'll put you on the spot. Do you mind if I put you on the spot? Right, this I is your podcast. It. Go for <laughs> it. Then we're going to get a little, we're going to get a little deep here. Okay. But, but did you have, did you have healthy conflict modeled around you whenever you were growing up? Can you think of a, can you think of a place where there was healthy conflict modeled around you? No, no. Yeah. Uh, it's an easy no for me. And yeah. that's where. I think a lot of my struggle has been, honestly, this last year has been very transformational for me because I, there was a leadership development plan I had to put together for a class, which was 20 pages long, all about me. And <laughs> it was um, easy for me to write because I'm, I'm very quick to note my flaws. And a lot of it was pointing out my weaknesses. Of course, the hardest pages were pointing out my strengths, but the the a lot of my weaknesses or a lot and a lot of where I wanted to be or I want to be as a leader or as a person, I recognize how far away from that person that I was describing um, oh, interesting. I, I was. And a lot of it had to do with uh, some of the schemas I have about myself, about how my behavior results from those schemas and, and the way that I I handle conflict and I handle um, I handle myself in situations. A lot of the time it was people pleasing or trying to um, to make other people happy and uh, sacrificing my own needs for the benefit of others, which mm -hmm. has its place, but not all the time and not in the way that I was doing it. Yes, absolutely. And you, and so there's two things about that. And thank you for sharing that and letting me put you on the spot. But the, the first thing is, is that I've asked that question to thousands of people and I rarely do I have people that say I did see it modeled and I saw it modeled in a really healthy way. Mm. So what that means is, so if you take these thousands of people and you use that as a sample, it means that the, hypothetically, it means that the vast majority of people never saw it modeled. They never saw two people having a conversation of different opinions, level-headed, and being like, what do you think about that? And asking questions and saying, okay, I understand your perspective. I'm going to take that in and it's going to shift the way that I see the situation. Like we don't see it in our homes. And then therefore we get into these work settings. And of course, if like someone doesn't do their part on a project, like a day late, like, like all hell breaks loose, you know? Yeah. And, and we're not taught to go learn and read about it. I mean, maybe it's getting better in our schools now, but definitely not, you know, I'm an elder millennial. We didn't learn about that shit. Like we didn't learn anything. No. We were like, <laughs> no. And I can see what you're saying, how, how we end up just repeating the same behaviors that we saw, we whether it was repeat the same behaviors. Yes. Well, I I guess it goes, I mean, psychologically, I guess it goes both ways. Either we repeat the same behaviors or we do the exact extreme yes. opposite and it really nowhere in between. So if we were modeled brushing things under the rug as a child and not mm -hmm. discussing, not bringing up when something's bothering us, then that's exactly what we're going to do when somebody maybe oversteps their boundaries with us. We're just going to let them do it and not bring up our emotions or not, not discuss with them. Like it's not set a boundary further or or address the issues. Uh, and any of the remaining could be true. If you saw somebody coming home and they were constantly having angry outbursts every time somebody crossed them, you could end up being that person who's had these extreme angry outbursts at work and you don't really understand why. And you think that it's fine. You think it's the way that people communicate because you've never seen anything different. The Can same for sweeping things under the rug. Yeah. Like you're like, no, harmony is better than everything. So I'm going to sweep it under the rug because I don't want to feel any tension. And that's the way it should be because that's all I know. 
which of course, you know, I guess we, we have to speak in generalities here because we don't have a whole lot of time to, <laughs> to dive into things. But of course, there are times where you do want to sweep something under the rug or there's sometimes you want to sure. get more sort of aggressive. Like, so if this isn't, a, these aren't blanket statements, but if the point you're making, if people listen to that and understand and maybe start to self-reflect a little bit of what are their tendencies, what do they lean mm -hmm. towards and is it serving them in their careers or in their personal lives, I think they would benefit greatly from that. And, go learn, and, and you can go learn a framework, right? So like I started with Fierce Conversations. That was the first framework and book that we taught whenever I was in corporate and then radical candor and difficult conversations, mm -hmm. crucial conversations there. Uh, and then I teach, I teach and use appreciative inquiry in my practice, which is all about analyzing the questions that you are asking. So there's a great book on that called conversations worth having. So I think, you know, we only have 30 minutes, so I won't tell you about all of these, but but when you start to peel that onion, you realize that there's different frameworks and there's things that you can experiment with and learn about in the way that you relate and the way that you talk to people that can make your work better. It can make your personal relationships better. It can make mm -hmm. you, a, it, it can help you with parenting. You know, it's like we, we start with this foundation of, oh, maybe I wasn't taught <laughs> or I don't know how to have conversations, right? Like you can admit that to yourself and go, go get interested in it start reading about it. It, it will open you up to a world that you might not know exists. And what's really cool is that it, you don't have to be in a formal leadership position to do any of this. No. It doesn't matter. I, I, People, so many people wait for their leader to make the change or their manager to change. So that Please they can don't make some do change that. Dynamics. <laughs> and, and it does, it drives me crazy because can't, I mean, I bet you this, bet you, you can think of somebody that you've worked with in the past who was not in a formal leadership position, but made a huge impact on the culture. We all Absolutely. know those people and it's because they, they behaved in a healthier way, or they, they had certain characteristics about them that brought a sense of light or levity or joy or support to the workplace um, that Absolutely. other people didn't, that wasn't common in the culture. So people gravitated towards that person. They were a leader without the formal position of being a leader. We can make that and decision to be that person. Absolutely. And, and I also like, that is my dream is that we find out how to identify the, those people. And then we convince them to go into leadership. And there's a lot of, this is, I'm going to nerd out on everybody here for a second, but Rob Cross has this um, tactic that he has is called organizational network analysis. So the the abbreviation of it is ONA, and it is able to see like who are those who are the magnifiers, who are the who are the people that everyone goes to. So I've got this little dream is that in the future we find out those people who are informally leading. They are the people who are inspiring mm -hmm. followership just by being helpers and doing their job really well. Yeah. And that that is how we identify leaders and we stop looking at the pick me, pick me people that are the ones that generally get promoted into leadership positions. Yeah, right. They're the ones who typically are really good at their jobs and which is why they're promoted. So that whatever their task is, they're they're really good at getting those, the, hitting those goals or accomplishing their tasks, but they're not necessarily- Or they're really good leaders. at playing the game. <laughs> yeah, very true. Yeah, you know? they know exactly. And it's then they're a lot always- of the politics. They're always asking, can, when, when can I be a leader? What can I do to be a leader, right? Yeah. Like they're always having waving their hand in the air. And I mean, this is, the data backs this up is that the people waving their hand in the air usually are the ones that get promoted. And then, you know, the, the continuous cycle that we see when we're analyzing organizations is that you have this thing that happens over and over again, where you promote that high performer, the person waving their hands in the air, they get into a leadership position and they crash and burn because they don't know how to translate their skills mm. into leading people. Right. And it might be that they needed to learn those skills prior, or they might need an expert track. Like they might just, if you don't like people and you're a leader, go find another job, please. Right. right. <laughs> When I exactly. hear that, I like cringe and like your job is all about people development. If you don't like people, they're going to feel it. So yep. go find an expert track. That's such a okay. good point. It's such a good point. And, you know, we talk about change making in, in the beginning of this conversation. If you really want to 
instill some change and you want to shift the culture and get people's buy-ins, you better damn well know who those informal leaders are because they are the mm -hmm. ones that you want to really recruit to help get behind your change process because they'll be the ones to go talk about it and get other people on board with it. Those are some key players in change. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And promote them. Even and if they say them. that they don't want to be leaders, you press and you have that conversation about what does leadership mean to you? You might have a misguided definition in your head, especially if you're an introvert or you're a woman. Let's reframe the word so it doesn't it doesn't indicate power and it indicates helping. Yeah. Convince those people, those informal leaders to go and take on teams, if you don't mind. That would help us out a lot in the world. People are listening right now. I want to go back <laughs> a second and just compliment you and point out something that you modeled a really important behavior that is, if we talk about conversations, you asked for permission before putting me on the spot. Yeah. And a lot of people don't do that. And they'll just jump into the question and it makes people uncomfortable. By asking me permission first, you gave me an opportunity to respond and say yes or no to that, which is a great conversational tactic. It allows people to feel like they're a part of the conversation as opposed to being cornered, like they have to answer something. So I think that was yeah. a... a a great example right there of a, uh, a healthy conversation tactic <laughs> that, that we can use. Yeah. It, another one, this is the, another easy tactic is saying one of the things I do in my workshops and when I'm working with people is helping them construct the opening whenever they have a really heated issue that they need to bring up. Cause that's where it goes wrong mm -hmm. is, I mean, <laughs> We, we get this wrong so often is that yeah. we go in and we want to be right. We're talking at somebody and not with them. We're using um, judgmental language that if I always say that if you need to judge your opening statement by how you would react to it, mm -hmm. like people always want to tell someone they're disappointed in them. And I'm like, you're not a mom or dad. You don't yeah. get to be disappointed in another human, Ugh, you know, such a good point. Yeah. Like there's all these things that we do that in, even in that opening first 30 seconds, we have sent that person to fight or flight or fawn, right? Exactly. And so, but if we know that what we can do is construct it from a place of non-judgment from a partnering place mm -hmm. and, 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 and a back to tactics, what I always tell people is if they screw up and that opening statement, it's okay. Like, don't put pressure on yourself. You can just say, I didn't do well. Let me start again Yeah. and try again. Like I'm laughing ask for because... permission, ask to start again. It's okay. Yeah. Be a human being. <laughs> You're just a human on a floating I, rock. Like chill I, out. I'm laughing because <laughs> I've. Yesterday I had to go film for a, an organization that does, that has like an online, um, online database for, for workplaces that just has short 15 minute trainer videos that nice. usually, usually relate to uh, mental health in the workplace, but they also teach people skills that can all, it overall improve the culture, which ultimately improves mental health of the organization. And yesterday the, the video I was making for them was about difficult conversations and everything that we're talking about here came down to it. And really what it, it, again, it comes down to is just remembering like the, the humanity that exists within the workplace and not going into these mm -hmm. conversations perfect, equalizing that power differential in the conversation and coming from a place of collaboration and teamwork of trying, hey, this is why we're having this conversation. Here's where I'm hoping to go with it. Would you want to, could you join me on that? in this process of getting to that goal, let's figure this out together, as opposed to coming in and saying, you've done this wrong, you keep doing this over and over again, why do you do that? And being accusatory, exactly what you said, you're putting someone in a fight or flight, they're getting defensive, their back's against the wall, and they're gonna defend themselves. And either they're gonna leave the conversation really angry, or they're gonna leave it completely defeated and and a lot less happy what have you than done? They before. And, right. and then you're going to go accuse that person of not being able to accept feedback. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I exactly. It really depends on how you approach those situations and those conversations like we're talking about that we have, um, although they may seem insignificant if we're having one or two, we have one or two outbursts here and there, it does, it, it, especially as a leader, it sets a tone within the culture 
pretty quickly. And those things add up. And if you have a terrible con or conversation that goes really poorly, or you attack somebody, or you shame them in front of everybody else, you're setting a precedent within that workplace that like, I better not cross this person. I better do what they say. Um, this mm -hmm. is not a safe place to be. The, the, I'm not going to share my ideas. Big. Exactly. Exactly. I can't make a mistake. I better be perfect. I'm going to be stressed out. I better put more pressure on myself so I don't screw my job up. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be shamed public. I think people are more afraid at work of being publicly shamed than they are of being let go. I have yeah. no data to support that, by the way. I'm just, it's, it's just a, a, a statement I'm making, well, but I think it's more. use a little bit of the psychological safety data, right? Is that like, we have this yeah. really innate fear of coming across like naive or incompetent and it drives a lot of what we do. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. And I guess it applies. I have to think of my own bias in that and my own, <laughs> my own belief systems of wanting to look good at work and it's the high achiever mentality. Like mm -hmm. My biggest fear is probably look being shamed at work instead of being fired. So I need to consider also there's some of my personality thrown into that statement. I don't know. I think you're, I think that's really, no, that, that's really human. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, I guess that's part of the self-work. You you guys just heard also <laughs> the self-work, self-reflection <laughs> process play out right there going, I made a statement. Let me, before I continue on with that statement, let me check myself for my own bias to make sure that it's not influencing what I'm saying. Yeah. Is it a me problem? Yeah. Is it a me problem? Which oftentimes it is. I want to bring up something too that you were saying about like, uh, okay, so in Radical Candor, they have a really nice model, right? Is that we yeah. want to, you want to stay in this place of being able to speak honestly with people. Um, and, and then if you're not doing that, then like, if you don't care about, and it's the intersection between caring personally and challenging directly. And mm -hmm. if you're not challenging directly and you don't care personally, personally, you're just, or if you're challenging directly and you don't care about the person, you're obnoxiously aggressive. If you don't care about the person and you're not challenging directly, then it's like manipulative insincerity. It's like where office politics live. Mm -hmm. So it's people being like, oh my God, Blake, your podcast is so good. But then like going behind your back and being like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what this looks like in entrepreneurship world. I can tell you in corporate America, right? It's like trying to stab people in the back and then telling them they're doing a great job to their face. Sure. I'm sure and that then, happens all the time with this podcast, by the way. <laughs> no way. <laughs> I know. I know. It didn't even work. Um, I'm sure it and happens. The, and... <laughs> My one listener. Shout out to the listener the out there. <laughs> and the other quadrant where you care so much that you don't want to tell someone the truth is called ruinous empathy. So, so the, I actually, what we see a lot in cultures is more ruinous empathy than obnoxious that? aggression. So ruinous empathy is when everyone's just telling everyone what they want to hear and no one's actually having a conversation. Mm. So all the drama kind of happens behind the scenes. And so like, and if you ask people, would you rather someone be obnoxiously aggressive with you? Or would you like them to be ruinously empathetic? Most people actually prefer obnoxious aggression, which is really interesting. Like there is mm. this desire to be told the truth. They don't necessarily want someone being an asshole, but like, we want to hear the truth. And, and when we don't know what someone, where we stand with someone, it creates a lot of anxiety as well. So again, this kind of goes back to the point of like, how do we move towards this space of not being so scared to tell people the truth and, but also regard them as a human being? Like, that's where we want to live. If possible, sometimes there's weird power yeah. things that I wouldn't actually advise that, but like, that's, that's whenever our minds are at peace is when we can live in that zone. Yeah. It's, it's so nuanced to each individual organization and culture of yeah. trying to find that sweet spot of how do you create a psychologically safe place where people are supportive and care about each other, uh, their personal and professional lives at the same time, how do you promote healthy conflict? Mm -hmm. How do you, you know, it's, that's a balancing act right there. It's and that's hard. really tough, which takes time. I think the biggest piece of what we're talking about here that people don't recognize is they think they can take these principles and just go into work tomorrow and make this massive change. And the truth is these changes can take years to make within mm -hmm. your culture. And they they really take a lot of trial and error, chipping away, 
slowly getting buy-in from all the different stakeholders within the organization. I mean, this is this is a long-term process and a long-term commitment to your organization's success. Yeah, and and it's sometimes it can get overwhelming, but what I would say is just to start small. Like maybe even if you think about the conversations that you have, um, just if if you this this is just one thing to try because there's lots of things to try, but try to calm your mind while you're in that conversation. Like don't try to think about what you're gonna say next. Hmm. Like listen to the like what we call as different levels of listening. Level three of listening is when you turn off your mental chatter and you're actually like noticing what the person's saying and how they're showing up and their energy. So like if you can work on just, I always call it a mental chattel, chatter valve, mm -hmm. like turn that valve off and tell your thoughts to kind of calm down a little bit. Even that little tiny thing can make a huge impact. So figure out those tiny things that you can try because this is the last thing I'm going to say on this, I like, um, like people are not used to being listened to. There's this great book that's just called listening and it's like, if you poll people and ask them, like, when was the last time you actually felt listened to the numbers are in the single digits. Yep. So what, what I say with that is that like, that's how much impact learning a couple conversation tools, learning how to listen. Like if you can just learn a few of these things, you've automatically differentiated yourself because like the vast majority of people are so bad at it. They like, don't even know how to listen to each other. Yeah, we, we we talk about that active listening piece and and actually hearing people for what they say. And it there's a point that I've heard so many people make is that oftentimes when you're having a conversation with somebody, we we view it as a competition, not a conversation. So we're mm -hmm. looking for something to add to the conversation or to feel like we contributed it to it in a successful way and can walk away from that conversation like we just made an impact. And the reality is sometimes we just need to hear the other person just to listen. We don't need to provide solutions or feedback or answers or responses. We just need to let them know that they were heard and validate them and they can move on with their day. Most of the time when people come with complaints, they're not actually asking for anything to be done. They're just, they're just looking for a way to vent so that they can move on with their day and get whatever they need to done. But it's sort of like that, the another valve, I guess, like a blow off valve where they have to just let out that steam for a little bit, mm -hmm. be heard, and then move on sometimes. So we we also have to get good in these conversations of judging in the moment of saying, is this is this person asking me for a solution here or do they just want to be heard? Or even asking them in the conversation, do you want, are, do you want some solutions here or, you know, how can I help you in this situation? Yes, that, definitely that asking. All the answers. Yes, <laughs> I. It's it's asking that question, right? I think that's like the things that we. It's like these small tactical things that you can do can make such a difference. Is saying, do you want to be listened to right now, or do you want me to help you solve for this? Because here's the other thing about humans. We don't listen to other people's advice. We have to come up with our own conclusions. So if you're actually going to help another person inside that conversation, it's by asking good questions and helping them figure out the answer that they already have. That's a very different tactic than saying, let me tell you about all the things that I think you should do. This is what I would do in your situation. Right. Right. Making it about us instead of about them. Yeah, because you don't have the same experience as somebody else, right? And right. that's really hard. Like especially I don't do uh, I don't do a lot of coaching because I was like so trained that you never tell anyone advice, so like it's very exhausting to me. But that's a mm -hmm. coaching tactic, right? Is yeah. and this is also how you know if someone's a good coach or not. If you ever have a coach that's like telling you all the things to do, they're not qualified. Sorry, but it's just, just kind of true. If you have a coach that's helping you think through, asking you questions, paraphrasing, repeating back, like what you're saying, helping you figure out your answer, like that's what actual coaching is because we have to come up with ideas and solutions to our own problems. That's the only way we're actually going to have energy towards moving towards them. Yeah. I think most of organizational psychology, leadership, organizational development, mental health care, most of it is really just coming up with very well-crafted questions. If you're a practitioner, yes. that's pretty much the majority of what we're doing is just coming up with really good questions. Yes. And listening to you. <laughs>
Yeah, right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Well, this has been such a pleasure to talk to you. I would love to be able to direct people to you and uh, for people who are listening, if they want to have a conversation with you or reach out, where can they find you? I am all over social media. So you can find me on LinkedIn. You can find me on Instagram. It's Kara at Insights Leadership. That's the name of my company is Insights Leadership Group. And you can also find me on TikTok. I got <laughs> I got in that trap a few years ago. And so I mostly make like humorous videos there, but you know, I have nice. fun. So um, yeah, so, and you can reach out to me. I'm all over the place and I always love to help organizations. I love to give workshops and I, and I'll, I'll even talk to you. So if you have an issue that you want to talk through, I can ask you some good questions yeah, to help you figure it out on your own. <laughs> I also have a podcast that is, um, it's just based on Ted Lasso. So it's me and my friend and we unpacked all, all the leadership lessons that are baked into Ted Lasso. So if you're interested in that little niche, that's out there for you as well. I love that so much. So much. <laughs> it was fun. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. Everybody who's listening, we appreciate or listening or watching. We appreciate you joining us today. If you are listening to this, uh, do me a favor, go leave us a five-star review on wherever you're listening to this podcast on whatever platform, if you enjoyed it, if you did not enjoy it, you can just keep moving. You know, you don't have to yeah. give me that one-star review does nothing for me. I, I enjoy the <laughs> feedback. If you want to hit me up on social media and give me some negative feedback, like, Hey Blake, you talk too much or Hey, no one cares. You know, just let me know and I'll take it to heart and be depressed about it for days. And then I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll fix the problem. But, um, if you enjoyed it though, go ahead and leave that five star. If you're watching this on YouTube, do me a favor, like subscribe to the channel. And if you can write in the comments, one thing that you've learned from today's episode that you plan on using in your workplace. Kara, thank you so much for joining thank me. Thank you, Blake. It was so nice to spend this time with you and I'll talk to you soon. What a nice conversation. <laughs> <laughs>